you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 2 Samuel chapter 8. I know this means absolutely nothing to you, but I do not intend to preach long at all today. I don't think my voice can go long today, but uh, I just feel the presence of the Lord. I've been walking in this, sensing that God is doing something. I, I know we've been in revival and prayer conference and all of that, but I just believe that God is doing something amazing. The last few days we've seen people say, delivered, healed, filled with the Holy Ghost, called into ministry. I'm encouraged. I want you to know that what God's doing through this house is bigger than you know. I, I, I'm not saying that to, to build something up or to hop. I'm just telling you God's doing something in this place that we ought not take for granted. I want you to simmer on that for a minute. God's doing something in your life and in this place. And I, I'm just saying this to the glory of God, but this week as I've traveled, I've been in three or four different states ministering and speaking in different places, kind of piled all that in on one week. And uh, so I've been able to hear the comments. And it's amazing to me. People just, I don't know, that come up to me and say, we watch your church services every week. You know, we've been on TV. We did TV ministry for 20-something years. And, and you're limited with that. They have to be able to have access to it. They have to have, be able to get that on their cable station or be able to pick up the frequency. But the wonderful thing about what we do and what a lot of churches are doing now is if you have Facebook or Internet or Roku TV, you can pull up these church services anytime and watch what you want, when you want. And it's really an amazing thing. And people literally from around the world are reaching out to us and they're watching this service. Oak Park is literally, uh, I don't know how it's happened, but there's people around the country, around the world that watch. And so uh, you need to know that we're kind of leading the way for some folks into the presence of the Lord. I don't want us to take that for granted because there's a heavy responsibility. When I stand here, I always feel a responsibility primarily and, and, and absolutely to to who I'm speaking to in this room, but also know that through those cameras and technology today, there could be somebody that's at the end of their rope about ready to give up and about ready to throw their hands up and quit, and it could be that today that God does something significant. Amen. We had a wonderful testimony during our revival that, um, that God did something incredible, a wonderful lady uh, who watches every week from New York State Receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost while watching a church service. Amen. And uh, it's just amazing to me. If you have your Bible, 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1, we had a power surge. If some of you are wondering why that screen's not on, we had a power surge just before the service, and it knocked something in that screen off, so we'll be taking an offering up after a while. I'm just teasing. <laughs> but thank you for your giving, because we don't know what we're going to have to replace, but something. Uh, Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1, after this, somebody say after this. after this. Ah, that's what I'm preaching today because I cannot get it out of my spirit. All week long, for two weeks, I've saved it for this morning. I've not preached it anywhere else, but a couple of weeks ago, God began to put that into my heart. I kept noticing, I read about eight or nine different places where I kept seeing those words that jumped out at me. And it says, after this, it came to pass that David attacked the Philistines and subdued them. And David took Metheg, a moth, from the hand of the Philistines. And it came to pass after this. Somebody shout it one more time after this. Hallelujah. I don't know what you may be going through today, but I know that God wants you to know that there is an after this in your future. And whatever you're facing, it will not last forever. It will not last for always. But there is an after this that's going to shift you from where you are to where you're going. Somebody ought to praise God now for what God's about to do. Father, I thank you today for your word. Thank you for the anointing that makes preaching powerful and effective. Guard my lips. Anoint the ears of the hearer, the voice of the speaker. And God, I pray, hide me behind the cross. Your, the word says that your, the flowers fade, the grass withers, but your word will never pass away. God, let your word take root today in a powerful way. And I'll give you praise for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. The Bible says, after this, David slew the Philistines and he subdued them. After this. The Bible says that David smote them and he subdued them. And it says that David took Megeth, Metheg, Emma out of the hands of the Philistines and he subdued them. After this. One more time because I want you to get this in your spirit. Will you say that after this? 
You know, this word has been in my heart. I shared something on social media this week about it, and I've got a friend. He said, you know, we've got a friend that just wrote a whole book on that, and my, my buddy Kevin Wallace has written a book on that title. I totally forgot about it. It's just full disclosure. I've not heard the sermons or read his book yet. I've got a copy that he gave me, but this word got in my heart, and I, I said, i got to read that book because I keep hearing this word after this. You know, for the last two years, we've been through what we've been through, and some of you right now are still walking through some of the residue of that. You can't hide from it. You, it's, like we, it's like you think that all of this is behind us completely, and then you walk through another season of it. And, and some of you have, have, have experienced the effects of that, many in a lot greater ways than others. But I want to tell you that whatever you're walking through, whether it be physical, financial, emotional, spiritual, there is an after this moment. And you're going to help me this morning preach. I believe that because today I just, want to, I just want to share with you what I hear the Lord saying. I want you to, one more time, would you just reach over? I want you to prophesy today. You know, you can do that. You can declare a thing. And I want you just to, you may not feel comfortable shaking their hand or any of that, but just kind of look at them and point, their, point your finger. Come on, do it. Find you a good neighbor you can point your finger at and tell them after this. Come on, tell them. And now look at them. Keep looking at them and say, hold on. Hold on. Say, don't lose hope. Don't, lose hope. don't throw in the towel. Don't, don't give up. Don't turn your switch of faith off. Because after this, God's going to take what the devil meant for evil, and he's going to make it good. In Jesus' name. There's something beyond this. You need to know that where you are right now is not the end. As long as there's breath in your lungs, as long as God woke you up today, you are not at the end of your rope. This is just a temporary inconvenience. It's just a hallway. It's just an in-between place. It's just a valley in between two mountains. Tim Hill wrote a song most of you have probably never heard, and it says, I'm not on, in a valley. I'm just changing mountains. I'm just going from one high spot to another spot. And sometimes that place is called meanwhile. Do you know what meanwhile means? You know, that's a, a good King James Bible word, meanwhile. It means that while you're in it, while you're in it, it's mean. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It is a meanwhile. Sometimes it's a little while, sometimes it's a long while, but it's a meanwhile. It's, it's hard, it's painful, it's trying, it's dark, it's uncertain. Remember that, that after Elijah calls down fire from heaven and after his servants saw that cloud the size of a man's hand, the Bible says, and it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind and there was a great rain. And the great rain came after a me the meanwhile. The great blessing came after the meanwhile. In the meanwhile, there were dark clouds and winds. For somebody today, you know what I'm talking about because you're there right now. You're in that meanwhile. You're in that little while where it gets mean. You know, where it seems like life is mean at you and people are mean to you and situations are mean to you and the harsh winds of adversity are blowing in your life right now and the dark clouds are obscuring the sunlight you're in the meanwhile I love I've, I've flown on an airplane a few times in the last couple of weeks and when we left I think Seattle after we dropped our grandkids off there and in Seattle it's always kind of cloudy and misty and rainy you very very seldom do you have sunny days and somebody had just said we were leaving and somebody that lived there that was meeting our kids they said you know the sun never shines in Seattle and we got on that airplane, and they were right. It was raining. It was cloudy. I mean, the clouds were thick. You couldn't see hardly through the fog. And it was a little chilly and cold, and it seemed that the sun never shines in Seattle. But it's a matter of perspective. Because we got on that airplane, as we began to ascend to about 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 feet, and we went through, it got worse before it got better. Because we pressed through those thick clouds, and when we did, that whole plane began to shake. And if you weren't accustomed to flying, you would have thought we were falling out of the air. And it presses through all of those clouds and that turbulence. And then when you press through that, you realize that the sun is shining after all. The clouds give you the perception that the sun doesn't shine in Seattle. But the reality is the sun never stops shining. 
The difference is it's our perspective and it's the atmosphere that we find ourselves in. And I want to tell somebody right now, you may be under the storm clouds of life. You may be in the meanwhile. But what you have to do is to ascend in the spirit beyond the clouds and realize that above that atmosphere of depression and discouragement that you may find yourself in, that the sun, the S-O-N, is still shining in your life. Come on, somebody give the Lord praise this morning. God sent me here to tell you, I believe this. I've preached a lot of sermons, and I didn't come today. I haven't preached the same sermon twice in the, in the times I've preached this week. God's given me, I told Kim last night, I sat down, the Lord finished this word for me, and I said, I don't know if it's a sermon or if it's just something to say. But all I know is when I sit down and I read the scripture, God knows that I have, I've had a limited time, and it's like the last few days, I'm just saying this, in the last few days, even in my personal study, it's like God gives me, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got so many things going on in my mind, and then I'll sit down, I'll read the scripture, and it's like God understands that, and he knows why I'm doing it. He knows, he honors that, and it's like I've sat down, it's like the Holy Spirit just leaps those words. I'm not having to dig, I'm not having to struggle. Any preachers know what I'm talking about? You got to struggle and dig and try to, it's like the last few days, it's like that word just leaps out at me, and this after this, after this, I just kept hearing that going over and over in my spirit. After this, David smote the Philistines and subdued them. The word smote means what you would think it would mean. It means to attack, to smite, to hit, to conquer, to punish, to destroy. And then it says he subdued them. And I looked up the word subdued in the context that it's written in that verse. And the words that's used for subdued in the, in the Hebrew is to bring low, to bring into subjection. Watch this, to humiliate. I need to say something right there that we need to remember. God never told us that if we would serve him, that we would never have a problem. As a matter of fact, I preached this Friday night in a service I was in, that sometimes God trusts you with trouble. The trouble's not because God's punishing you. The trouble's because God trusts you. You remember Job. You can't get away from Job when you think about trouble. The Bible says that when Satan came to accuse before the Lord, before the throne of God, that the Lord said to Satan, he said, have you considered my servant Job? Job was the most righteous man in the east. Job was not sinning. Job was not in rebellion. Job was not living in a life where he was resisting the plan of God for his life. He was living in the blessing of God, the favor of God. And right in the middle of the favor of God, God says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Satan said, I can't get to him. You put a hedge around him. He said, I'll release that so you can test him. He said, because I know Job, I can trust him with the trial because I know Job's not going to quit. Job is going to begin to dream, and Job's going to believe to trust me. You know the story. Everything happened to Job. That hedge was lifted, and it was as if God said, I can trust him with the test. I can trust him with the trial. And when that hedge was lifted and Satan came after him, he took his family, he took his children, he took his livestock, he took his home, he took his health. He took everything away from Job. And what I love about this is there's 42 chapters in the book of Job. There are 1,070 verses in the book of Job. In verse number 1,069 of 1,070, it begins by saying, after this. And the 1,070th verse that follows after this says, Job lived to be old and full of years. And God gave him double for his trouble. I just came to drop a pen right there and tell somebody, I don't know what you may be going through. I know some of you what you're going through, some of what you're going through. I don't know what those watching today may be going through, but I'll tell you there is an after this. And God has double the anointing, double the blessing. Hallelujah. If you'll trust him through the battle. Amen. God never told us that we would never get sick, never have a problem, never fight a devil, never be attacked, never have problems in our family. He, but he did promise that he would be with us through it all. In fact, the Bible says, and you hear me quote this often, Psalm 34, 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous. But you know, many are the afflictions of the unrighteous. The difference is, he says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. You say, well, pastor, what about that person that was sick and they died? Were they saved? Yeah. 
Well, God delivered them out of them all. For to live is Christ, to die is gain. That is the ultimate reward that we have. Death is not a big deal. Death is not a loss. Death is a win. When we are a Christian and we breathe our last breath in this life and we breathe our next breath in the next life, we haven't lost a thing. We've gained everything that we're pressing toward. Come on, somebody. Another important scripture is found in Isaiah 43 and verse 2. When Isaiah says, or God said through the prophet Isaiah, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Not if, when. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. And when you walk through the fire, it, you shall not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle up on you. This is what the Lord told me to say today. He told me just to come up here this morning and just share with you and tell you, if you will not give up, if you will not give in to fear and doubt, if you'll keep on walking through the fire, if you'll keep praising God at the midnight hour, if you'll hold on to his word in the face of every contrary and negative report, you will come to an after this moment. And I don't know what this is for you today. It may be a bad doctor's report. It may be a long season of sickness. It may be the loss of a loved one. It may be a painful divorce. It may be a deep pit of debt. I don't know what your this is. I don't know what, what this is to you today. And I don't have to know. All I know is that there is an after this. Come on, somebody that believes it, give the Lord praise. In the words of Prophetess Lynn Anderson, God never promised you a rose garden. He never promised me a trouble-free life. He never promised me that I wouldn't have trouble. As a matter of fact, he promised us we would. But yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. He never promised me a mountain with no valleys. But he did promise me an after this. This is not deep, <laughs> but it's rich. Because somebody needs to know God never promised you would not have to go through a valley, but he promised you the mountain. He never promised you you wouldn't have to walk through the waters, but he promised you wouldn't get drowned. He never promised you wouldn't have to walk through the furnace and the fire, but he promised you would come out of it purified. Amen. The scripture says, our text says that David fought with the Philistines, and yes, they caused him much grief. Yet he won a few rounds, they won a few rounds, and David took some hits, and David felt the pain. And, and church, I love y'all too much. I tell everybody that. I love y'all too much to stand up here and try to lie to you and tell you that being a Christian is a trouble-free life. It's not. If I told you that, it would, it would go against the experience that I've had in my own life. It wouldn't be true. Being a Christian does not make you immune to a trouble-free life. But what I can tell you with assurance and with confidence is that when you go through that trouble, and I'm speaking to somebody today, you're here right now, and you're in trouble, and when you go through that trouble, God's going to be with you. He's holding your hand in the midst of the darkest hour of the soul. God is with you. Amen. And you'll never walk through the valley alone. That you'll never, he never promised we'd have another, that we'd have never hear a bad doctor's report. He never promised that you would never cry over wayward children. He never promised that you'll never be lied on or that you'll never lose someone you love or that, that there won't be times when you feel like quitting, saying, I can't do it, I won't do it. Because... It, Listen, but I can tell you by the authority of God's word, if you'll hold on, there is an after this moment that's coming into your life. What happened after this in David's situation? The Bible says in our text that David smote the Philistines and he subdued them. Subdued means to bring down, to beat down, to bring under subjection. And my favorite word in that definition is to humiliate. David smote them and then David humiliated them. Humiliate means to, obviously, to embarrass or to put to shame. And I believe, <laughs> I believe that there's comes, I'm starting to feel the anointing right now because I believe there comes a time when the devil has thrown everything he's got at you 
The devil's tried to, and he almost had you. Some of y'all in this room, I'll just stand here and tell you, there have been one or two moments I could testify to you about in my life from the time I was born that the devil almost had me. He almost convinced me that there was no help and there was no hope. He almost convinced me that there was no future and there was no dream. He almost convinced me to give up and to quit. There have been a couple seasons where I almost believed the lies of the enemy. Amen. But I believe somebody's getting ready to step into an after this because here's what I know. Amen. Let me tell you something. Every time the devil throws something at you that fails, every time he sets a trap that misses you, every time an offense he throws at you fails to stick, every time he knocks you down and you come back stronger, every time something he throws at you backfires in his face, how many understand that he is humiliated and he is embarrassed? I I got to tell you, when you walk into this place this morning and you just walk through COVID and here you are and your body's racked with all the effects of it, maybe you're sitting here today like Mark Fillers who encouraged me this morning and you've had a diagnosis that is not a good diagnosis, but when you come to church like he did, he's done today and others of you said, I don't feel like it. The enemy seems like my body's racked in pain. My mind is tormented by the things going on in my life, but you came to church today, and let me just tell you, you did more than just show up for people to see you, because the enemy of your soul watched you walk in those back doors. He saw you singing as his choir led us in worship. He seen you lifting your hands. He heard you saying amen, and every time you said hallelujah, you're humiliating the one who's trying to kill you. Every time you come to church, you humiliate the one who thought that he'd wiped you out. He thought it was over. He thought you were finish but then you came to church and you sang one more song you gave one more praise you gave one more offering and every time you do that you are humiliating the one who's trying to take your life hallelujah come on you ought to humiliate him good right now and give God a praise even in the middle of your stuff glory to God <laughs> let me just put that verse in my own words after this, the tables were turned. After this, David came back stronger. After this, David made the enemy sorry he ever messed with them. After this, David hit the enemy where it hurt. After this, David humiliated the enemy, publicly embarrassed him and put him to shame. I believe that our praise humiliates the enemy. The Bible says, David said in Psalm 57, he said, they have laid a trap before me in which they have fallen themselves. The very thing that the enemy tried to use to capture you, he falls in it himself, humiliated. You know, the Bible says, I'm almost done. Musicians can come. Aren't y'all amazed? <laughs> After this, y'all going to walk out and say, I can't believe he only preached 25 minutes. But I'm not done yet. <laughs> I just ask musicians to come. I tell you who I've had on my mind lately. I've had Joseph. I love the story of Joseph. Love it. Because you talk about somebody that understood the power of an after this. The Bible says that Joseph had great favor on his life. He was a dreamer. And you know, you know, Joseph came by that. I don't know that I've I should. It's so simple. It's so right there in front of you and it's been preached. But I I don't know why when I preach on Joseph, I, for, I, I just don't connect, you know, because sometimes you can look at somebody. My dad's been going 40, he's been going to heaven 40 years this year, 40 years. And every time I preach back in the Chattanooga area, I'll inevitably have somebody. My dad pastored in the town that I preached in Wednesday. He preached there, pastored there 40 years, 50 years ago. And I had people coming up to me and say, your dad was my pastor. I got saved under your dad's ministry. I got baptized in the Holy Ghost. That's always a great blessing to me. And somebody say, you remind me of your dad. Well, I, I haven't, my dad's been gone for 40 years. It's not like I, I intentionally capture traits that my dad had. They said, the way you hold your face, the way you move, the way you preach, reminds me so much of your dad. And I think about Joseph. Joseph was a dreamer. But then I'm reminded of who his daddy was, and the apple didn't fall far from the tree. Because you remember his daddy, Jacob, was a dreamer too. And you remember Jacob was favored of God because, you know, he was born. I won't go through the whole story, but you know how 
He had a twin brother, Esau, and the Bible says that when he was in his mother's womb, of course, they didn't have ultrasound. She didn't know what was going in there, on there, but she had great pain in her, during her pregnancy. So much so, the Bible says that she asked God to take the pain away because what was going on, there was a WW2 or WWF wrestling match going on in her womb between Esau and Jacob. And God gave her a dream that there would come a time that these babies would be conceived and that Jacob would be the one who would who his brother would bow down to does that sound familiar with Joseph that his brother would bow down to him but the problem was those twins Esau was born first which gave him the birthright he was the firstborn but you'll remember that Jacob grabbed his heel on the way out they had wrestled in the womb and Jacob grabs the heel of Esau on his way out as if now he didn't know what was going on but God knew even as an infant there was a there was a prophecy hanging over his head there was a destiny for him and he was reaching for that dream and he reached and he grabbed Esau's foot as he was born you know the whole story how 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 his mother decided to deceive Isaac the father and put a, he was going to give him the blessing from his deathbed, and he sends Joseph in there. Esau meant Harry. Jacob meant heel catcher. And God, the, his mother put this garment, uh, animal's garment upon him that was a skin that was hairy so that Isaac's eyes were, dim, were dimmed. And so he goes in there and, you, you know, he was deceived. His, but it was, his mom said, look, I want to make this happen so bad. This is not on you. It's on me. And so Jacob goes in, and his father, through his bad eyesight, he lays his hand, and he fills Jacob with that garment on. He believes it's Esau, and he blesses him. And Jacob receives favor. And Jacob, from that day on, he began to run from Isaac because there were two nations out of one womb, Abraham, Isaac. And from Jacob, or from Isaac, seed that would be born Jacob and Esau, two nations born out of one womb. So Jacob, he's running. He's running from Esau. He feels like his whole family's against him. He feels like there's no hope. It feels like nobody understands. And Jacob is going to a place. The Bible literally, some translations record that he was at the end of a road. He'd gone as far as he could go. And Jacob was discouraged. It was like life was over. This destiny that had been prophesied was just merely words and that there was no hope for him and Jacob laid his head on a rock and made a pillow out of it and he went to a deep sleep and he was at a place I want you to hear to see the imagery of this and he was at a place that was at the end of the road there was nowhere to go from there and all of a sudden he goes into this deep sleep and the Lord gives him a vision and he has this dream of angels ascending and descending a ladder and when he awakes, he had wrestled with God, and the Bible says that he walked back with the lip. Can I tell you, you'll never encounter God and walk away the same way you came? And Jacob encounters God, and he takes that stone that had been used as a pillow, and he made it a pillar. And he said, this shall be called the house of God. He said, because the presence of, I love how the scripture says it, because the presence of the Lord was here, and I did not even know it. Somebody right now in your pain, the presence of the Lord is here. You may not realize it, but he's with you. And after this, God's taken you from faith to faith and glory to glory. That same dreamer, Jacob, it passed on to his son. I don't know if Jacob ever sat down with Joseph and said, son, let me tell you about my dreams. But Joseph began to have dreams and Jacob looked at Joseph and out of all the brothers and remember Jacob's name Jacob who was who was abandoned who was forsaken who was bitter who was who had felt like the world had ended did you know at Bethel God changed his name and God said you're no longer going to be called heel catcher Jacob but you're going to be called prince of peace and there's a word for that Israel and in a week or so God willing I'm going to be standing on a land that was given to the descendants of the man who thought he was at the end of his road. And that place that we pray for every day is named after a man who was at the end of his road, ready to give up until he got a hold of God and he began to dream. 
Joseph was a dreamer. From the time he was born, his daddy, Jacob, saw what in him what he saw in himself. He made him a coat of many colors, placed it upon him, marked him as a dreamer. You know, I know I'm supposed to be quitting. But I've thought about that. I've got to say this. I, I've only said this one other time. I met with my kids at Christmas, and I've talked to every one of my children. I watched Marcus Lamb. I don't know if some of y'all know who that is, but he passed away a few days ago. And Marcus Lamb was a friend of mine. He's been, he was so good to me, especially as a young minister. And he was such an encourager, a wonderful man. I wanted to go to his funeral. I couldn't go, and I watched the live stream of it. And as I was watching that live stream, Jensen Franklin spoke one of the greatest funeral sermons I have ever heard in my life. And he spoke to those kids. Of Mar I remember all of his kids when they were just little, little bitty things like my kids. And now they have families of their own. They're grown. They're married. And he said something to those kids. And I don't know why I'm saying this. But he, he was preaching his message. He just stopped and he looked at him. He said, he said this legacy, this, this anointing, this call, you know, it may look like it is at the end of the road. He said, but there's an after this because you're special. Just because you're the, and he said something about preacher's kids. He said, you know, preacher's kids, he said, the whole time, he said, I always told my kids, you're no different than anybody else. And I'm thinking, I did that too. I was trying to protect my kids. And he said, but I've come to realize after my kids have grown, Jensen said, that he said, you are different. There's a mark upon you. From the time you were born, it's different. It convicted me so much that I gathered my kids because all through their life I was a PK and I know how you're under a microscope in a glass house. And I always told my kids, I said, you know what, you're just kids. And I meant well. I said, you're no different than anybody else's kids. I'm, I want you to live for the Lord. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach like I'm going to be a dad to you, not just a pastor. And I, I want to raise you in church and I want you to love the Lord. And I want you to worship and I want you to understand who Jesus is in your life and all of that. But I said, you're no different than anybody else. And I'm not going to put any higher restrictions. I said that over and over, meaning well. And at Christmas time, after I saw that funeral, I got all my kids together and I apologized to them. My kids are all grown with kids of their own. And I said, I told y'all, mistakenly, that you're no different than anybody else. But you are. There's an anointing on you that's generations deep. There's a call on your life that's generations deep. And it's not just because you're a preacher's kid. Every one of your children, you are anointed, you're called, you're a Christian, you're a born again, you're filled with the Spirit, and your kids are not just normal kids. Your kids have a destiny, a purpose a, a, attached to their life. And I looked at my kids and said, you're not normal kids. You're never going to run from the call on your life. There's an anointing on you that's unique. It's different. And you're never going to be able to hide from it. No matter where you go, you're not just a preacher's kid. You are called by God out of your mother's womb. God has placed. There's prayers. There's prophecies hanging over your head. And Joseph was that kind of boy. He was different. There was something unique about him. You know it. I'll preach through this real quick. You know that Joseph had to go through a process. God gave him a vision. And God said, I see. I see your brothers, your family bowing down before you. But you know, somebody, some people just can't handle your vision and the dream God gives you. And Joseph, while he had the vision, he began to share it with people who couldn't handle that. And as a result, they became jealous of him. They became jealous of the favor upon him. They became jealous of the dreams upon his life. But Joseph, Joseph could have quit. But how many understand sometimes God will trust you with trouble? And so Joseph, look at his life. God says, I'm going to cause you, I'm going to raise you up among men. I'm going to give you favor. I'm going to give you a, a, a position. I'm going to give you a voice. I'm going to give you authority. And before he got there, Joseph was, was chased by his brothers. They hated him so much that they threw him in a pit to die, a grave. They literally buried him alive, except they didn't throw the dirt on him. Slaves, slave traders came by. And they thought, well, you know what? We might get in trouble for this. Let's just... Let's Benjamin talked him out of it and said, let's just, let's just go ahead and sell him into slavery. Looks like things are getting worse. But after this, he went to Potiphar's house. And he gets to Potiphar's house, and he's serving in one of the most wealthy homes, and he gets raised up. Favor just brings him all the way up to the top at Potiphar's house. But then old Miss Potiphar falsely accuses him of doing something he didn't do. 
and he, Joseph keeps his integrity, and she falsely accuses him, and he ended up in prison. And it looks like things are getting worse before they're getting better. But after this, he met a baker and a butcher. And the baker and the butcher were having dreams. And Joseph in the prison began to interpret the dreams of the baker and the butcher. And after this, the baker and the butcher went to Pharaoh's house. And they overheard Pharaoh, who had been having these unusual dreams, say, Is there anyone in the house of Israel who can interpret these dreams? And they said, We know a, after this, they said, We know a man by the name of Joseph. Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dreams. And when he interpreted Pharaoh's dreams, he gained faith among Pharaoh and from the pit to Potiphar's house to prison to the palace there was after this moments all along the way that led him until he became the second in command in Egypt and a nation that was starving to death that was in persecution and peril God used Joseph just like he told him many decades earlier he would use him the dream came to fruition can I tell you, you know this, I've said it before but if Joseph had not went to the pit, he would have not been sold into slavery. And had he not been sold into slavery, he would have not ended up in Potiphar's house. And he not ended up in Potiphar's house, he would have not been falsely accused. And had he not been falsely accused, he would have not ended up in prison. And had he not ended up in prison, he would have not met the baker and the butcher. And had he not met the baker and the butcher, he would have not interpreted their dreams. And had he not interpreted their dreams, the baker and the butcher would not have introduced him to Pharaoh. And had the baker and the butcher not introduced him to Pharaoh, then he would have not been able to interpret Pharaoh's dreams and if he had not been able to interpret Pharaoh's dreams, Pharaoh would not have given him favor to be second in command in Egypt and to raise his family up, an entire nation and to save them alive and what the enemy, the Bible says to Joseph what the enemy meant for evil God turned it around and made it good, but God there is an after this moment in your life come on stand with me all over this room you may not understand it you might not know why you are where you are now. There'll come a day when you'll look in your rearview mirror and you'll say, I thank God that he was on my side. Because if it had not been for the Lord on my side, you don't know it when you're in the middle of it. You don't see it. You can't see it. When the doctor gives you that report, you don't see the end of the story. When you're, when you're going through that terrible relationship situation that you have no control over you don't see it when your finances are crashing and your business is struggling and you get the pink slip at work you don't understand that God is just preparing you for an after this moment and I just want to tell somebody today don't grow weary in well doing and if I can take liberty with the scripture because after this you shall reap if you faint not don't stop. Come on, turn to somebody again and say, after this. After this. Come on, look back at them and say, after this. You're going to be amazed at what God's about to do. I feel his presence in this room. I'm going to pray for you where you are, and I'm going to invite you to come if you want to because of the climate we're in. I'm just going to pray because God can touch you right there where you are. But I want you, wherever you are right now in this room, man, y'all look good this morning. There's some folks in this room. I had a man come up to me went Friday night. I think it's yeah, Friday night in prayer at the altar service. He came up. I said, I said, I don't know. There was some, he didn't look like a preacher. But I said, I mean, nobody looks like a preacher nowadays. Preachers don't look like preachers. I said, are you in ministry? And he said, yeah. And I said, what do you do? He said, I'm the children's pastor here. I found out after church that a year ago, him and her both were laid up in a crack house so high a year ago, I don't know if that's, well, I ain't going to say that, <laughs> a year ago, and God, he began to testify what God had done in their life. I'm like, God, there's some sons and daughters at Oak Park. There's some grandchildren that I have their names on my prayer list, and I lay my hands on it every day, where grandma and grandfather, mom and daddy have said, please pray for my boy. And I say, what's their name? And I write, I, with my mind, I go write it down. And I lay my hands and I pray for them every day. And I had him pray for me. And I said, I'm standing in right now for every son and daughter and grandson and granddaughter of the house of Oak Park. And I'm believing that what God did for you, I'm standing in for them right now. And instead of me praying for him, I had him pray for me. 
And I declare that right now there's some boys, there's some girls. Some of you are raising grandchildren. But I'm going to tell you there's an after this moment that's coming. There's some, there's some mamas about to become mamas. And there's some fathers about to become daddies. And there's a turnaround going to happen because after this, after you pray, after we fasted, after we believe, I believe in the name of Jesus there's some of you that have gotten some bad doctor reports, but there is an after this. I preached on watch this, but after this, there is something that's going to happen that you're going to stand back and say, I didn't do that. The doctors didn't do that. The medicine didn't do that. You know, do all that. Do everything you can do. But that wasn't the chemo. That wasn't the radiation. That wasn't the treatments. That, that was God. That this is an after this moment. I just want you right now, if you're saying, Pastor, I am right now in a moment. I'm in one of those meanwhiles, moments. You say, I need an after this in my life. I believe that the Holy Ghost is going to go right where you are this morning, and he's going to touch you. If you're in this room and that's you, would you just lift your hand? Wherever you are, just lift your hand right where you are. Come on. There's a bunch of you. There ought to be a lot more than that. Come on. Come on. I'm waiting on you. I want you to leave that hand up. If you're able to leave your hand up, I want you to leave it up. And I want it to be, I want it to, to lift up like a lightning rod. And just like that power surge hit whatever it hit right there and affected it right now, right where your hand is lifted, the power of God is going to fall on you like a lightning rod. And there is going to be an after this moment that's going to begin to manifest in your life even now. Even this morning on this 30th of January 2022, there is an after after this that's coming to you now. Father, in the name of Jesus, God in this choir, in these sides, on the risers, in the balcony, on the floor, every hand, you see it, God. You know us better than we know ourselves. God, you're intimately acquainted with everything that we're facing and everything that we're going through. And Father, right now as I stretch my hand toward every man and woman that has their hand lifted today, I declare in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Head of the Holy Ghost, I declare that right now, there is an after this moment. Joy is returning in Jesus' name. Healing is coming in Jesus' name. Blessing is coming in Jesus' name. Favor is coming in Jesus' name. You're restoring it in Jesus' name. There is an after this. What the devil meant for evil, God is going to make it good. And Father, we declare in the name of Jesus, we will humiliate the devil. We will subdue the devil. He will be humiliated by the blessings of God that are coming in our after this moment. Father, I believe in the name of Jesus that there is restoration, that there is healing. God, that there is, there is deliverance that is in this house in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. Come on.